We're doing a brand new study called The Song of Love, which is a study of Song of Solomon. I've actually written a syllabus that goes along with this, and uh, if you do not have a syllabus, the address will be, the web address will be on the screen at the close of this program, and so you're welcome to contact us, and we'll be happy to see that you can receive a syllabus and study along with these lessons. Our lesson today is called Love's New Call. And this is taken from Song of Solomon, the second chapter, and verse 8. The maiden is speaking, and she says, The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. Now, this is a description of uh, Solomon coming to her home to visit her early in their relationship. I pointed out previously that there's actually six different songs in the Song of Solomon. This is the beginning of the second song. The second song. We just concluded the first song. This is the second song in the Song of Solomon. It actually runs from chapter 2, verse 8, through chapter 3 and verse 5. It's describing a time when Solomon comes to her home to visit her. We don't know anything other than he's come and it's in the springtime and he invites her to come and walk with him on the mountains. So let me divide this into different sections so you can remember what I'm going to say. Let me first of all talk about inviting love, inviting love. He has come to her. And she uses the word here, my beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. This is in verse 9. This is the first time that she's used the word dear to describe Solomon. Remember, he uses the word dove as a pet name for her. He will refer to her that through the rest of Song of Solomon. This is the first time she's word, used the word dear, but it becomes her favorite term for him. And so again and again, she calls him my dear, my dear. And she's referring to, like I said, she's a shepherd girl. She lived out on the hills and the mountains and had seen the deer. It's a beautiful, graceful animal, and that's what she's describing his appearance to her. He comes leaping and jumping. So obviously... Solomon is young enough that he's running here. He's not just, I mean, he is in a hurry to get to her house. And so that's the way that she describes him. He's calling out to her, come away, my love, come away, my dove. It, it's springtime, and he starts describing it. The birds are singing, the flowers are blooming, and, and he's describing it. What he does, he invites her to come and walk with him on the mountain. Of course, that's a mountain setting where she lives. We do not know the reason why. All we know, she describes herself as hiding in the house. He's outside. He's calling for her. She sees him. But instead of going to him, she sits alone and hides in the house. She's doing what we would call playing hide and seek. Now, I, I don't know why lovers do it. There's many, many, many different reasons why this happens, but I think it happens in all relationships, and it's little tests that lovers tend to give each other to see, does he really want me to go with him? Or you know, and, and, and I don't know why we do it. I think it goes back to immaturity and its roots, but uh, we'll talk about that later. Whatever the reason, she doesn't follow him. She rather hides in the house, and she describes herself as saying, he is behind our wall. She calls it our wall, but the truth is, it's separating them. Now, you don't want that in your relationships. You don't want the barriers, the walls that sometimes we build between ourselves. No. And, and she can say whatever she wants to about the wall, but the truth is, he's on the outside and she's on the inside. There's something that has come between them. 
She describes him actually from going from window to window looking for her and calling for her. And so this, this inviting love, come walk with me, and yet she fails to do so. I, I, I think all of us can identify with this sometime in our relationships where we missed the cues some way. We, we weren't on the same page and, and we did not respond in the correct manner. Now, the second part of this lesson, I'm going to call it inspiring love. Inspiring love. As he invites her to come and walk with him on the mountains, he begins to use these beautiful analogies. It's springtime, my love. It's springtime. It's the time of love. And he uses the word, the song of the turtle dove. Remember the dove became his favorite term that he described her. And he's saying, the song of the turtle dove is in the air and the fragrance of the vineyards. It, it, it's filling the air. Come and walk with me. Let's walk together on the mountains. Springtime. Springtime is a beautiful time in all relationships if it's used wisely and correctly. You're only young once. Don't waste it quarreling. Don't waste your youth on trivia. Use it wisely because it will soon be gone and summer will be here. But instead of her in accepting his invitation, she continues to hide in the house. I, I, again, I, I don't know why we do this, but let's think of it in spiritual terms. Have you ever failed to follow Jesus? Has he ever invited you to come walk with him? Has he ever given you an adventure of faith? Has he ever asked you to do something and you hesitated, you delayed, you didn't follow? That's exactly what's happening here. Now, we know, just as with Jesus, if He's not going to quarrel with us. He's not going to beat the door down. You know, that, that, that's foolish. I, I've seen men resort to those kind of tactics when their wife doesn't respond properly to them. If you don't open that door, I'm going to kick it in. No, 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 no. You, that, 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 that's not the way you build good relationships. Solomon doesn't quarrel with her. What he does, he withdraws. He goes to walk on the mountain, obviously, alone, by himself. I've discovered that in my relationship with God. God never comes down to my level to quarrel with me, to argue with me, to try to convince me, you need to do this. No, he will give me a command and a promise, but it's up to me by faith to follow him. Now, I think the same is true in our relationship with each other. Instead of playing hide and seek, we need to find ways to open the doors. She has a window. She can see that it's him. Why doesn't she follow? The Bible doesn't tell us, and I think for good reason, because all of us have different reasons that we don't follow. It's then that another voice breaks in in the song that we have not heard before. It's a masculine voice, and it's plural. This tells us that uh, somebody else is singing. Now, as I've stated before, I believe actually this was written as a song to be sung. And so you have different voices. The main voice is the voice of the maiden, the second voice, the voice of Solomon. Then you have what's called the daughters of Jerusalem. These are female voices, and there's they're plural. There's more than one of them. But this is the first time that we hear what's called her brothers. Her brothers. We don't know how many of them there were. All we know, there's certainly more than one because it's plural. And written in the Hebrew language, it's obviously masculine in its tense. So it's not the women that's talking here. It's what's called her brothers. And they... These masculine voices speak up and say, the little foxes that spoil the vine. Now, that, that's, a, that's a very important statement. It's, it's a word picture, actually, because if you grew up around the farm, as she did, 
around the vineyards, and that's what her brothers are doing. They're taking care of Solomon's vineyards in northern Israel. They've leased this vineyards from him, and, and uh, now they're, they're talking about the vineyards, and they're saying, there's little foxes there. Beware of the little foxes. Now, what, why do, what do they mean, the little foxes? The little foxes are things, little things, that gnaw at you. Let me describe what they are seeing. And this is a word picture. Uh, the, the fox, the mature fox, when it's hungry, it will go to the vine and it's able to stand on its back feet, its hind feet, and reach the grapes and eat the grapes. The little foxes can't do so. The little foxes, all they can eat is if the grape falls down from the cluster of grapes as the mature fox is eating them. And uh, a lot of times in their frustration or even in their youthful playfulness, the little foxes begin to gnaw at the base of the vine. Well, if you know anything about farming, when you start gnawing uh, around the base of the vine, you're going to kill the vine. And that's what they're talking about. They're using a word picture here. They don't say the fox or the foxes, the big ones, the mature ones. No, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. The little things that gnaw at you. The same is true in our relationships. It's not the big things that destroy our relationships. Oh, no, I tend to disagree. Somebody said, but... But he cheated on her. He, he committed adultery. Yes, 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 I understand. That's the big one that comes after how many little things? The little things. In fact, I am convinced it's impossible to commit adultery if you have a perfectly good marriage. If you've got a healthy relationship, that's the best thing to keep you away from immorality is by having a strong, healthy relationship, marriage relationship. But the little foxes, those little things that just irritate you, the little things that gnaw at you, the little things that you don't like, and, and, and uh, you know, we look at it and say, well, what, what's the big deal? Well, it's not a big deal. It's a little deal plus a little deal plus a little deal, and when you add it all up, it becomes a big deal. That's what destroys marriages. And that's what they are warning her. They're saying to her, why are you hiding in the house? Why are you doing this? These, these little things that, that, if you're not careful, the little things will grow into big things. They add up and they will destroy the relationship, just like the little foxes will gnaw at the vine until they kill the vine. So beware of those little things in your relationship that will ultimately destroy the relationship unless you are willing to deal with those things. That's one of the things that I, I've discovered in my own marriage, my own relationship. Uh, as a young man, so many things, I didn't take them seriously because they didn't mean anything to me. But then one day I began to discover they meant something to my wife. They meant something to my daughters. And so if it's important to them, it ought to be important to me. And I changed the way that I thought. I stopped thinking about, well, why, why are they making such a big deal out of a little deal? I still don't know the answer to that. All I do know is those little things start adding up, and if you're not careful, the little things do become a big deal. So don't allow that to happen. The next thing that I see in this is what I'm going to call immature love. We've already been seeing pictures of it as she hides in the house, and I think probably the root problem behind all of this is immaturity. Isn't that where we all begin in our relationships? And, you know, in our loving relationships, usually romance starts when we are still very young, that we fall in love. And thank God, God is a genius. He, he knows what he's doing. 
young people know how to work these things out. I was thinking about an older minister that told me one day, he said, I used to, when I would see a couple that's always quarreling with each other, I would tell them, uh, you know, it, it might be good if you just separate for a little while and, you know, back off on the relationship so that you stop all this quarreling. He said, I don't do that anymore because I've lived long enough now. I'm a little bit older and a little wiser. And I've realized that, you know, I know they're fussing with each other now, but they'll get older. And when they get older, they'll get tired. And when they get tired, they'll stop fighting with each other all the time. Well, there's a lot of wisdom in those words. Immaturity. Thank God, thank God that, that God gives love to young people. Thank God he gives babies to young people. Oh, yes. God's a genius. He knows what he's doing. She is responding selfishly to him. And again, we don't know why. All we know is she's sitting in the house and He's taking a lonely walk on the hillside without her. She could have been at his side, but she sits alone in the house. But then she makes a statement. And again, this is one of those key statements that you find three times in Song of Solomon. This is the first time we find it. In Song of Solomon 2 and 16, she says, My beloved is mine, and I am his. Now, what's wrong with that statement? It, it, it sounds like, you know, poetry, sounds romantic. What's wrong with it? It's selfish. That's what's wrong with it. She starts out talking about my beloved is mine. That's the focus. And then she says, and I am his. It's obvious she is selfish in this relationship. She's trying to control this relationship. And we're going to see it very clearly in the next lesson that that's what she's trying to do, is trying to control him. Listen to me, friend. That's not true love. That's selfishness. That's perverted love. That's loving yourself, not loving your lover. Trying to control. Even God doesn't do that. God gives us a free will where that we have the choice to respond. In fact, that's what love is. Love is the choice of the heart. It's the choice that we make. But she's responding selfishly to him. My beloved is mine and I am his. Almost like an afterthought. I am his. What she's trying to do is hold on to her lover. Now listen to me, listen carefully. I've discovered something. There's something that's better than holding on to your lover. You know what that is? That's allowing your lover to hold you. I discovered this as a Christian. As a young Christian, oh, I struggle so many times trying to hold on to Jesus. Boy, we even had songs about it, holding on to Jesus, holding on in and it's almost like he's trying to get away from us. No, 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 no. That's a false concept. No. But as I've matured and my relationship with Christ has matured, I've come to understand I don't need to try to hold on to him. I just need to rejoice in his love and allow him to hold me. It's so much better. The same is true here. Rather than being selfish, rather than trying to control the relationship, rather than trying to get your way. See, this, this is a problem. The problem for too many lovers is they want to win every situation. They always want to win. But if you always win, that means somebody else is losing. Now, what you want to try to do is turn every situation into a win-win, where it's something that's good for you, it's good for her. It's good for him, it's good for her. It, it's good on both sides. A win-win situation. But too many couples I've seen, and this is where a lot of quarreling and fighting takes place, they want to win-lose. I always want to win. I want to win the argument. I want the last word. I want... If you're always winning, somebody else is losing. 
And nobody wants to live like that. That is not an enjoyable place to be. That's selfishness. And that's where she is. It's in her immaturity. But this is what she's doing as she's trying to control the relationship. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. And so I, I challenge you, in every situation, try to turn it into a win-win situation as much as you can, where there's something in this for both of you. If you do that, that will be a long-lasting relationship. Now, it, it, this is not only true in our relationship as lovers. It's true in family relationships. It's true in relationships on the job. It's true in relationships in the church with our brothers and sisters in the church. It's, it's true in all relationships of life. And if you'll learn how to do that successfully, how to make other people successful, their success becomes your success. That's what she has not learned at this point in this stage in her life. And I think it's simply because of her youthfulness, because of her immaturity, that she's making this mistake. But she later, she reverses it, and she says, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. She still can't give up trying to hold on. But the third time she makes this statement, she simply says, I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. She's finally matured in her relationship. She admits that shadows have fallen on the relationship. It's one of the words that she uses there. She says, oh, my beloved, be like a young deer or a stag on the mountains of Bether. The word Bether in the Hebrew literally means separation. She says, until the shadows flee away and the night is over, be like a young stag and return to me. Again, that is a selfish statement. And she admits, shadows have come. Something has separated us. I'm alone here in the house and he's out there somewhere walking on the mountains. What I've discovered my relationship with my wife, it's better to mend that relationship as quickly as possible. One of the scriptures that I try to live by because I've had to deal with anger all of my life. It's just a part of my personality, being a type A, hard-driving person. And if I'm not careful, I get angry about things and that's not good. You don't build strong relationships with anger. But there's a good verse of scripture that says, do not allow the sun to go down on your wrath. In other words, settle it quickly. Say, I'm sorry. For, ask for forgiveness. Try to learn from it. What, whatever the mistakes are, don't allow this thing to drag on. No. Mend the relationship as quickly as possible. She admits that shadows have come, but instead of her seeking him, she continues to hide, sit in the house, waiting for him to come back to her again. See, she could have been walking on the mountains with him, but instead she's sitting at home alone in the house. That's not a wise decision. I'm so glad she learned from that, and we never see her making this mistake like this again. Oh, yes, yeah, she's not perfect, and she's going to learn from some things that she does, but we find that she learns from her mistake, and she learns to go seek him. I, I would challenge you, learn from what she is saying here. See, relationships start dying when we stop following. What was it that attracted you to your lover in the first place? Renew those things. Go back and look for those things again. Go back and remind yourself of those things. There was something that was there. What is it that, that brought you together? Build on those mutual attractions rather than on the little things that you don't like, the little things that gnaw at you. 
Our relationships are always in a process of growing or dying. They always are. And if we are not careful, we will allow ourselves to allow little trivia, little things to come between us from the people that mean the most to us. Don't make that mistake. See, I, it's, it's one of the things that I see that men tend to do, that men, when we get married, we're, we're, we're conquerors by our nature. We, we want to be winners. We want to be protectors and providers. And, and it's that challenge in life that helps us throw out our chest and feel like a man. But if we're not careful, we treat our wives the same way. We, you know, once she says, I do take you, we think like, wow, <sighs> I've won that one. Now let's get on to something else. No, 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 no. Never think of your wife that way. If you do, you're making a mistake. Keep building on the things that attracted you to her in the first place. I really believe that probably the greatest reason for the failure of relationships is immaturity. I believe that not only to be true in our marriages, I believe it is also true in our walk with God, and our relationships in the church. I see people that quit churches over the silliest of reasons, the simplest little things, and they allow them to divide them. That's immaturity, my friend. It's time for us to grow up. See, if we allow immaturity, the little things to control our lives, immaturity will destroy our relationship. Don't make that mistake. And I thank God that she turns this thing around and we find her going and seeking him in chapter 3. That's what we need to do. If you're making that mistake, then forgive the little things. Get rid of those things. Watch for the little foxes that spoil the vines. May God bless you in your marriage today.